Okay, hey guys, we are going to talk about chapter 8, which is middle childhood, the social end of everything. So, to continue on talking about middle childhood, at this point in time, they actually have a drive for independence from their parents. And as their social world keeps expanding, and as they're starting to make friends with peers, and being able to cooperate and interactively play with them, they are starting to want more and more independence. So a self-concept is basically just how one views themselves. So how they think that they are intelligence-wise, but it also includes their gender identity. It includes what ethnicity they identify with, their personality traits, different abilities that they have, and their intelligence. So the self-concept is kind of all-encompassing on how the child views themselves. Social comparison <clears throat> involves the tendency to look at yourself and kind of compare yourself against other people, especially your friends and your peers. So you want to compare your athletic ability or how much you've accomplished in your life to this point. You know, considering it's middle childhood, we're not talking about very many years, but it's when you compare yourself to your friends and who's more popular, um, who can run faster, that kind of thing. So children value the abilities that they actually have and they become more realistic about their limitations as well. So they are kind of proud of what they can do, but realize their limits. So we also have a recognition of prejudice here and affirming their pride in gender and their background is going to increase. So like we talked about before, you have to be careful with pride versus prejudice. You want your children to be proud of where they came from and who they are, but you don't want them to think that they're superior to everybody else or anybody else. So that self-concept starts to be influenced by the opinions of others. So how their friends look at them, how they think their friends look at them. And of course, superficial attributes. So if they think they're pretty, um, if they think they're prettier than their friends or their friends are prettier than them kind of thing. Also, materialism starts to come into play here. So whether they're poor or well off is going to influence their self-concept as well. Erickson's stage we're at is industry versus inferiority. So we're in the fourth stage. The self-concept and social comparison that children go through are really crucial to this stage. They start to realize that things aren't fair and life isn't fair in general and that some people are going to be better than other people at certain things. So this crisis that they're in during this point in time is going to be characterized by this tension that comes to play between what they can do and what they can't do. So between productivity and industry versus inferiority and, and competence. So whether they can actively do things and have pride in what they can do versus they are so, um, they're so stuffed by what they can't do, they're stuck on it. Um, so basically what we need them to do is kind of master what they can do and develop a sense of themselves. So it's either going to be they're industrious or they're inferior, meaning they're either competent or incompetent. So we want to make sure that our children are encouraged to, you know, try different things and, enhance their abilities and not necessarily focus so much on what they can't do and focus on their limitations. We want them to look at what they can do, focus on the positive kind of thing. So what we also discover here is that if your friends that are the same sex, how they view you becomes very important during this stage. <clears throat> so they really want the approval of their same sex friends. They want to feel like they are the popular one kind of thing. Culture is, of course, crucial during this time because different cultures value different things. So signs of 
maturation here between these ages, middle childhood, 6 to 11, uh, that they can do specific chores responsibly. They don't have to keep being told to do their chores over and over again. They can get a weekly allowance and manage it properly as soon as they get a dollar. They're not running to the gas station to buy a can of pop or something, or soda, sorry. <clears throat> they can also manage activities and complete homework in a timely fashion. They're not waiting till the last minute to get their homework done or just not doing their homework at all. They're actually going to complete it. They actually attempt to conform to their peers because they want to fit in. They don't want to stick out. But again, you know, how much they conform is going to be relative. They express preferences for the, what they do after school. So now they want to watch TV after school or they want to come home from school, get their homework done, and then watch TV. But they get into a routine and they tell you this is what they want to do. They can accept some responsibility for pets or younger children, younger siblings, so they can remember to feed the dog or, you know, make a sandwich for their little sister or something like that. And they actually start to strive for independence from their parents. They want more responsibility. They want to be able to do these specific things. <clears throat> so as I said, culture is going to really matter here because different cultures ver value different things. Certain cultures, you know, value shyness. Others value honesty. Um, others value a work ethic. So it really depends on what culture the child is in. So this emerging self-perception is going to benefit both academic and social competence because the more um, competent they are in their selves, the more they positively view themselves, the better they're going to do academically and socially. So remember, we want to praise the process, not the specific static qualities. So we want to encourage growth. So you want to... Um, you know, if they fail a test or something, you don't want to focus on the fact that they failed that test. You want to make sure that you try to help them figure out where they went wrong. Did they not study enough? Did they not study properly? Did they use the wrong notes? You know, was it something simple? And then you want to try to help them fix that so that they can grow as an individual and continue to grow hopefully throughout their life. So praise the process. Make sure that you're going through it with them and that they can learn from their mistakes and not just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over. And like I said, if they do fail a test or something, make sure they realize that it's not because they're not smart. Everybody has the ability to be smart. We all have the same brains, as I told you guys on the first day of class. Everyone has the same brains. We all have the same um, potential. It's just what we do to get to where we need to be. So we want to look at incremental growth. We want to learn from this mistake and kind of move on versus, you know, the whole concept itself. So look at these individual mistakes. Try to help them revamp their process, so to speak, so that they can continuously grow from their mistakes that they do make. So culture, cohorts, and age are also going to influence attitudes about self-esteem. Research kind of suggests that we have unrealistically high and unrealistically low self-esteem. So this is going to reduce your effortful control. So remember that emotional regulation that we were talking about. And it can also lead to lower achievement and increased aggression. So if you think you're, you know, if your self-esteem is unrealistically high, you might think that you're kind of above doing everything and you don't have to do your homework. You don't have to study for that test because you're just that good. And we all know that's just not the case. Everybody has to study. Even Einstein had to study. On the other hand, if you have unrealistically low self-esteem, you might figure, why bother? What's the point? You know, I'm horrible anyway, so why should I bother studying? And we don't want that either. Some current research links low self-esteem to increased aggression and other 
studies look at inflated self-esteem with male bullying and aggression. So people with low self-esteem may kind of act out to make up for it almost. They figure they're horrible people anyway, so they might as well act out. And then people with really high self-esteem figure they're better than everybody else so they can bully those that aren't going to fight back kind of thing. So you want to make sure that your child's self-esteem is, you know, kind of in the middle somewhere. You don't want them to be too confident or almost cocky about it, but you also don't want them to think that they're not worth it. So you want to make sure we encourage children to have a middle-of-the-ground self-esteem level. Resilience and stress. Resilience is the ability to adapt well to significant adversity, and if you have a lot of serious stress, you can overcome it. So children that are resilient can handle stress better and, you know, kind of combat it and overcome it better than children who are not resilient. Resilience is dynamic, though, meaning that sometimes you can be resilient and other times you're just not. It can also depend on what kind of stress, what's happening. So sometimes you may be impacted harder from something than, you know, something else. So let's say if your parents get divorced, some children may be very resilient with this and other children may not. But within the same family, children can also be different. But it's also important to note that since it is dynamic, since it is changing, Let's say that your parents are still together, but they fight. So one day they may have a horrible fight, and as a child, you can get over it relatively easily. It's not that serious for you because you're resilient at that point in time. But let's say two months later, you have a lot going on in school, and you're really stressed about that, and then your parents get into a serious fight. Then you may not be as resilient. So situations and various stresses can, you know, be handled differently. But resilience is a positive adaptation to stress. So overcoming stress and being able to adapt is a good thing. The adversity has to be significant, though. So it has to be something other than, you know, you lost a dollar or you stubbed your toe kind of thing. So cumulative stress, as the name kind of implies, is stress that accumulates over time. Daily hassles can actually be more detrimental than isolated major stresses. So basically all that's saying is your daily life, the things you come into contact with, your homework assignments, school itself, after school activities, that all can kind of add up as opposed to and be more detrimental than if everything's always good, but then one day your parents get into a huge fight kind of thing. Daily hassles can actually add up to be so overwhelming. They can really have devastating effects. So that is one reason why I also told you guys, make sure you can handle your stress. Make sure you have an outlet for it. Because when you have midterms and when you have final exams, and they're all at the same time, you know, those daily stressors can actually be terrifying and can be very devastating. Social context is also imperative. We have something called child soldiers, which um, was basically a event that happened in the Sierra Leone where children witnessed rape and murder and often participated in the rapes and murders. And what they found out was about six years later, these children were pathologically depressed or um, like they couldn't overcome trauma very well. So that kind of shows you, I mean, yes, rape and murder is pretty extreme, but it shows you the impact that it can have even on a young child. Just the, even the children that witnessed, didn't participate, just witnessed the rape and murders were still detrimentally depressed and evasive and, you know, didn't know how to deal with stress later on in life. Homeless children have been found to be developmentally behind their peers. 
than children with homes. And of course, that's understandable as well. Children that, you know, live on the streets or live in different shelters every night. It's got to be very difficult for them to try to keep up. And then children that are separated after a natural disaster, the effects can be seen, especially if they're separated from their mothers after a natural disaster happens. What they found with all of these is that if the parents were around and the parents were involved, the children were more stable. But if they were kind of on their own or if something had happened to their parents, then it was, it could be very detrimental to their life. So what contributes to resilience? Almost all children can handle stress, but what determines how well they handle it? First of all, how they interpret the events is going to affect that. They don't have to take them personally. So if the family is not chaotic, then, you know, they may interpret it differently. So let's say you have a child of divorced parents versus a child of married parents. You know, those children are going to interpret events in completely different matters. The child of divorced parents may take things personally and think everything is because of them, like they did something wrong, versus the child of married parents who, you know, understands that it was never anything they did wrong. And even though that that child of divorced parents, even though it wasn't their fault and they didn't do anything wrong, they can't recognize that sometimes. So how the child interprets the events is going to determine if they can bounce back or not. The support of family and community, of course, makes things easier. If you have support of your family and community, it's a lot easier to cope with stress and easier to be resilient than if you don't. If the child has personal strengths, such as you know creativity and intelligence, it's also going to be easier for them to be more resilient. And what we need to make sure we do is avoid parentification. Parentification is when children act more like parents than children. So sometimes this can happen if the actual parents are not around, if the parents are drug addicts, if the parents are neglectful, if they just don't care. Or it can even happen sometimes if the parents are just working all the time. This makes the child feel responsible for the family and like they have to take care of their younger siblings usually. This usually happens to an older child. So they may feel burdened, like they can't escape, they can't get out. So basically, if your child does have to help around the house, if your child does have to kind of take over because you need to work and do all these other things, you need to make sure that the parents respect the child's contribution and know that or make sure the child knows that it's appreciated, it's respected, but it's not expected. Like they don't have to do it. It's not that they can't get out of it kind of thing. <clears throat> Usually when the parents make sure that the child knows that their contribution is respected, the children are very resilient. So Resilient children usually interpret the events not personally, not in relation to themselves. They have the support of family and community. They have personal strengths, so they're intelligent, they're creative, and they know that their contributions are well respected and appreciated at the same time. So shared and non-shared environments. Shared means you're living in the same house. Non-shared means like school, neighborhood experiences. So genes affect half or more of the variance for almost every trait. The influence of shared environment shrinks with age, so the influence of sharing the same house shrinks as you get older, but the effect of non-shared environment increases as you get older. So as you age, as you get older, your household environment doesn't matter as much and your school and neighborhood matters more. So they have a negative correlation, they're opposite. 
So if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because as you're living at home, the older you get, the more independent you kind of become. But the more independent you become, the more you're in school and dealing with people in your neighborhood. So it kind of makes sense that your home goes down and your your school and neighborhood goes up. So what I want you guys to do for this assignment here is on page 288 in your textbook, I want you to read the thinking critically. I want you to tell me if you think that it's okay for older children to take care of younger children and why or why not. Were you ever in a situation where you had to take care of younger siblings or your older sibling had to take care of you? Or are you in a situation now where your older child has to take care of your younger children? Is it okay? What kind of impact do you think it will have on the kids? And, you know, why or why not? Why do you think it's okay? Why do you think it's not okay? And why do you think it would kind of have that impact? Do you have the personal experience? Or are you just kind of thinking because of what we've been covering in class? Like I said, all of these activities and things that I do are to get you guys to learn and start thinking critically. So page 288 in your textbook, make sure you answer. Do you agree with older children taking care of young children? Why or why not? And do you have any experience with it? Do you know anybody? Are you in that situation? And what you're going to get if you do this before... I'll give you till Tuesday night. So before Tuesday, hold on, let me check the date real quick. Tuesday, March 21st by 1159. I want you guys to respond to this question. If you do before Tuesday, you're going to get 10 extra credit points on your next test. So the test over seven, eight, nine, you'll get 10 extra credit points if you answer that question. So, recent findings actually reassert parent power. So, the thing is that we have to remember, children raised in the same households by the same parents do not have the same experience necessarily. You can have a family of siblings that each sibling is kind of treated differently, and it happens all the time. Every time you're asked, who's your favorite child, we always say no. But if you look at how you treat children or how children are treated, I bet you any money if you have brothers or sisters or if you have children, your children or you as a sibling will say, well, I was treated better, my sister was treated better, my brother was treated better, whatever. You have an idea on what I'm talking about. Oftentimes it has to do with who's the baby, who's the oldest child, could have to do with who's the boy, who's the girl. Totally depends. But most parents just respond differently to each of their children. That's just how it is. Family structure. Family structure takes into account the whole family. So not only genetic relationships, but legal relationships with relatives living in the same home. So we have different kinds of families. We have the nuclear, the extended, the step family, and other types that we're going to talk about. Okay, real quick. I'm going to give those of you that missed the first two another shot. So one more chance at being able to drop your lowest quiz score. If you've already dropped your lowest quiz score, do not do this again. You're not going to be able to drop three. I've already offered drop your lowest quiz, and I've already offered a freebie. So if you've done those, don't answer this question unless you want to just because, because you love me. But for those of you that miss those opportunities, one time and one time only offer, read page 289 in your textbook, and then answer the question. Which one are you, and what was your experience like? So are you an only child? Are you the baby? Are you the oldest? And what was your experience like? Again, by Tuesday night. Okay, moving on. So family function is how the family functions, of course, to meet the needs of everybody involved. 
Function is actually more important than structure, but function is very hard to measure. So during middle childhood, families will help children making sure they have their necessities met. So making sure they have food, clothing, and shelter. Making sure that they're encouraging learning. You want your child to always learn. Helping them develop self-respect, helping their self-esteem stay, you know, in the realistic realm. Nurturing friendships, making sure that they have friends and if they need rides or whatever, taking them there. And fostering harmony and stability. You do not want a lot of fighting in your home. That's never a good thing. So children value safety and stability. They want to know that they're safe and secure. Military families, however, find stability very difficult. And caregivers are discouraged from making changes. So military families often move around a lot. So even though they have higher income usually and better health care, and often more education because the government pays for all of that, they have more stress because they move around so much. So we have some diverse family structures here. We have two parent families, the nuclear family, mom, dad, 2.1 children, the step parents where you marry somebody and so now you have a step parent involved with your children, adoptive family if you adopt children, grandparents that have to raise their grandchildren because something happened to their parents or their parents are just out of the picture, two same-sex parents, of course with same-sex marriage being legal now that's increased a lot. Then we have single parent families with a single mother or father that were either never married or they're divorced, separated or widowed, or one grandparent raising grandchildren. And then you also have extended family, which usually includes the parents, the grandparents living in the same house, or you can have polygamy with sister wives. So the single parent family consists of one parent and his or her children that are under the age of 18. 31% of all U.S. school aged children are considered having a single parent family. More than half of U.S. children will live in a single parent home for at least a year. And that's increased dramatically in recent years. 50, 60 years ago, single parent families were almost unheard of but now they're very, very common. Extended family, as I said, the parents, the children, grandparents often living in one household. 10% of school-aged children are in this category, and the family type is based on who lives in the same household. Polygamous families consist of one man and several wives, and they all those are children. 10% of children in some nations fall under this category, not necessarily the U.S. Per child income may be reduced, but this may actually be preferable to divorcing and remarrying. The step-sibling role is very challenging in this situation because you have so many children, all with the same dad but different moms. But <clears throat> the step-sibling role is challenging in any step-family, really. So again, culture, context always matters because there's going to be variations in support. Some cultures look down on extended families. Some cultures look down on single parent families. But in the U.S., the cohabitating structure is worse for children than marriage because it's a lot easier to separate if you're not married and if you're just living together. So just living together is actually harder and I think most of that is simply because if you're not married, if you don't have to go through all of that legal stuff to separate, it's a lot easier to walk away. Ethnic norms are going to create differences as well. And as I said, that single parenthood is accepted and supported depending on where you're at. Even the time frame. Like I said, you know, 60, 70 years ago, single parenthood was completely frowned upon. It just wasn't acceptable. Now it's a lot more acceptable these days. So nuclear families generally function the best. They usually have better educational, social, cognitive, and behavioral outcomes for the children. You have the mom and the dad in the same household. 
And even if both parents work, usually nuclear families are <clears throat> more stable. Mate selection and income related to nuclear families and the child's well-being. So basically what that means is that the mates kind of make each other happy, which in turn gives the family more energy. And usually they're going to make more money and be happier and healthier in general. A parental alliance can form between the parents so they support each other, which is going to have positive effects beyond childhood. So as opposed to, you know, mom and dad disagreeing on parenting and discipline, now they can form an alliance and work together. Adoptive and same-sex parent families usually function well, often better than the average nuclear family, but the ability to meet the children's needs varies greatly, simply because sometimes um, the adoption process is very difficult. So sometimes there are issues that come up with that. Sometimes when the children find out they're adopted, they feel differently. Sometimes if there's adoptive children and biological children, feelings can get mixed there as well. Some step-parent families function well. Positive relationships are usually more easier when the children are under two. It's a lot more difficult when the children come into the family as teenagers. A solid parental alliance is more difficult to form because oftentimes it's, I'm going to support my children and you're going to support your children kind of thing. So even though we're a family, we're still two entities almost. And child loyalty to parents is often undermined by disputes. For example, two people can be married, both have children, they all live in the same roof. If the parents get into a fight, the mom's children are going to side with her, the dad's children will side with him. And then it's very hard to get past that. Skip generation families, usually when grandparents are taking care of children, or grandchildren, sorry, usually have lower incomes because the grandparents are older and more health problems. So they're less stable simply because the grandparents, you know, are going to be advanced in age and the parents aren't around to deal with it. So this is going to be less stable for the children. On average, single parent families function less well because they have lower income instability. The single parent has to play both roles, the mom and the dad, and that can cause a lot of stress. Trying to make ends meet can cause a lot of stress. Daycare problems can cause a lot of stress. If they have community support, it's a huge benefit, though. So it really depends on where they're at. Two factors do increase the likelihood of dysfunction, no matter what type of family you have, no matter what ethnic group you're at and where you're at. Low income or poverty and high conflict. So if you do not make a lot of money, if it's very difficult to make ends meet, or if you're fighting all the time, that's going to make the family dysfunctional. A lot of families actually experience both because if you think about it, not making enough money is going to cause stress and stress can cause conflict. Any risk factor that damages a family is going to increase the stress on that family. So if it increases the stress, it damages the family. So they're correlated. The adult's reaction to poverty is going to be crucial in determining the effect on the children. If the adult reacts well to the poverty and, you know, handles it, deals with it, makes sure that the basic needs are met, then the children aren't even going to really realize they're poor. I always said that I grew up in a lower income area with my mom trying to work as a waitress to make ends meet. And I never realized I was poor until it was pointed out to me. So my mom kind of reacted well to it and handled it well. But if you are children and your mom's coming home from work or your dad's coming home from work constantly stressed and complaining about money and not knowing how they're going to get the next meal kind of thing, then you're going to notice it and it's going to be more stressful on the children. Wealth usually correlates with better family functioning, but it can cause difficulty too. Some children who are wealthy want to rebel against their parents. 
And again, the parental reaction is the key. If wealthy parents decide to pressure their children and want more out of their children kind of thing, that can lead to drug problems, alcohol problems, because they're rebelling. Um, but <clears throat> you also don't want wealthy parents just giving their children everything so they never have to work a day in their life kind of thing, because that's going to lead to other issues down the line. Conflict, as we can imagine, is going to harm the children, especially if the fights are about raising the children. Fights are more common in step families, divorced families, and extended families. Extended families because you have so many people in the house. Divorced families because of obvious difficulties with the parents and getting along. That's why they're divorced. And step families because you kind of had the two separate entities coming together. So genes can have some effect. But conflict itself is often the main influence on how well a child is, how well they adapt to stress, and how well they adapt to different situations. Culture, of course, big impact. It becomes more important in child or middle childhood. So certain habits, styles, and values that, you know, are within that culture are going to affect the children and how they grow up as adults. So it could be fashion, what they're wearing, language. You know, some children only speak Spanish, some only speak Portuguese, some only speak Chinese, and making any kind of crossover is more difficult. And peer culture, so what you peers are doing, what kind of games you play. School-aged children really value friendship. So as we were talking about before, the home arena starts to decrease and the friends and school arena starts to increase. Gender differences, girls have a tendency to talk more and tell secrets. Boys have a tendency to play more active games, rough and tumble play. They want best friends at this point. Um, children that do not have any close friends by the age of 11 are kind of more likely to be depressed by the age of 13. So we want children in the middle childhood range to develop these friendships and get close friends. Older children want more friends and kind of stick with their group of friends. If a friendship ends, they start to become more upset about it. They find it harder to make new friends, but they do look for friends that have the same interests as they do, the same values. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it. You want to hang around with people that want to do the same things you want to do. You know, so that kind of makes sense. Popular versus unpopular children. Popular children are liked and respected, of course, than less popular children. So with unpopular children, we have what's called neglected, not rejected children. These children are neglected by their peers, but they're not actively rejected. So they're just ignored. They're not shunned or penalized or made fun of or anything like that. They're kind of just ignored, like they're not even there. They don't enjoy school, but psychologically speaking, it usually doesn't have a huge impact on them. Because again, they're not bullied, they're not made fun of, they're just ignored. It's like they're not there kind of thing. Then we have aggressive rejected children. They are confrontational and antagonistic, so their friend, their peers just don't like them because of this. And then you have withdrawn rejected children. They're withdrawn and anxious, so their, their peers just do not like them. So aggressive rejected and withdrawn rejected are children that are not liked because of their own behaviors. They're confrontational or they're withdrawn. So that's why the peers do not like them. Neglected, not rejected children are just ignored. They're not doing anything per se. They're just ignored. <clears throat> Bullying, we talked about this before. Repeated efforts to inflict harm on a weaker person that you don't think is going to fight back. They can be physical, verbal, or social. A bully victim is someone who attacks others, but who is attacked at the same time. So somebody who has bullied themselves and then turns around and bullies others. It's also called a provocative victim 
because they do things that elicit bullying, such as stealing a bully's pencil, and then they turn around and bully someone else in return. So it's kind of a, they're doing it to me, so I'm going to do it to you kind of thing. So types of bullying, we kind of went through these already, but just to generalize them. We have physical, which is actual hitting, kicking, punching, verbal, name calling, teasing, making fun of somebody, relational, destroying their relationships, so making sure nobody else accepts them and they don't have any friends, and then cyberbullying, using electronics um, to harm someone else. Cyberbullying is on the rise simply because of the fact that it's so easy to say what you want when you're just sitting behind a keyboard. It's a lot easier to confront somebody when you're typing than when you're standing right in front of them. So the whole school has to be involved to eliminate bullying, not just saying there's the bullies, we have to handle this. The whole school has to get involved. Intervention is more effective in earlier grades than in later grades. And programs that actually might do seem to do good can actually do harm. So what we need to do is when a program is in place, we need to evaluate the results so that we can make sure it's having the intended outcome. Morally speaking, children make judgments. They can differentiate universal principles from conventional norms. So they can differentiate between what's universally accepted versus kind of what happens in our city kind of thing. Peer culture, personal experience, and understanding others or empathy is what really influences their moral development. So kind of what their friends think, what they've been through, and as long as they can understand others, they should have a solid moral background. Kohlberg came up with levels of moral thought, <clears throat> basically stages that children go through to get to their final reasoning. So we have pre-conventional moral reasoning, which are the personal rewards and punishments that they have for themselves. Conventional moral reasoning are the social rules and laws that govern the society. And then post-conventional moral reasoning are principles that are thought to be universal. The pros of Kohlberg's stages, the child's use of the intellectual, their intellectual abilities, kind of justifies that the moral actions were correct. Cons, they didn't take into account culture, they didn't take account gender. As we've talked about many times, different cultures value different things, so different cultures are going to have different moral judgments. Uh, boys versus girls, that was ignored. And differences between child and adult morality was not addressed. So children can kind of think, well, things aren't fair. But as an adult, hopefully we have a better moral development than just things aren't fair. Life isn't fair. Um, often loyalty to the family is kind of a big thing. Friends or family over friends kind of type moral, moral reasoning. So three common values between six and 11 year olds, protect your friends. Remember, we're in middle childhood, so friends are everything. Don't tell adults what's happening. We don't want our parents to know. We don't want the adults to know. It's just between us kind of thing. And don't stand out too much. So in middle childhood, their values kind of revolve around their friends and school environment. So again, it goes back to your family and home life decreases during this time and your school and neighborhood and your friends, peers increase during this time. So the impact is very evident here. When values conflict, oftentimes the loyalty to the peers is chosen over what we would do as adults. So middle, middle childhood children will take their friend's side over the adults. And that's kind of where the don't let the adults know comes into play. With age, we can answer moral questions and we can look at consequences and intentions and we can actually consider these. So as we're gonna see, as the children are getting older, growing into adolescence, 
they can actually start to look at why somebody did something and what kind of consequences are there. So that's the kind of things I'm asking you with the moral dilemma I gave you about your family member is sick and this medicine can save them, but you don't have the money. Would you steal it? As an adult, we can look at the intention. We can look at possible consequences and we can offer more thoughtful answers to these moral questions. So that's kind of the whole point of this class to get you guys thinking. So that is all. Remember Tuesday, answer the question. Do you think that it's okay for adult children to care for younger children? Why or why not? Do you have any experience with it? 10 extra credit points on your next test. Read the page in your book that correlates. And for those of you that missed the first two opportunities, you will have a one-time, one-time only opportunity with the other question I said, which I'm not going to repeat now. <laughs> so Tuesday night, 1159. Bye.